four islands. 1,000 players, split amongst four different elemental races. Ice. Earth. Fire. Air. Each with their own unique strengths and weaknesses. Would they be able to coexist in harmony and live in peace, maintaining balance amongst all four elements? Or would the elemental world break out into an all-out war? While many would argue that war is inevitable under such circumstances, this is not a story of war. This is a story of faith pilgrimage, friendship, and unity. This is the story of a holy order that sought to be that very balance amongst all four elements. This is the story of enlightenment. Enlightened Church of Fire didn't just appear out of nowhere. You see, players were made aware by the admins of the Races Civilization event that Season 3 of Races is not canon to any of the previous seasons. So players had to come up with new storylines and rework their character lore. This worked out perfectly for me personally as I just finished building, or more accurately, restoring the Temple of Fire in my own kingdom on the Loreworks world building server, dedicated to the Phoenix, the symbol of my nation. And it just so happens to be that one of the race picks for Season 3 was Fire, with the lore behind it being that the Fire race are possible descendants of the legendary Phoenix, granting them an unnatural ability to reincarnate themselves and become stronger. So to make it canon with whatever storylines I had going on in the background, I explained that my participation in this event is solely thanks to the Fire God Soul, who saw my efforts with the Fire Temple and decided to unceremoniously yoink me out of one world and place me in a different world, an alternate reality if you wish where my faith towards him and the holy fire would be tested. And so I decided to make a cult, I mean a church. The Enlightened Church of Fire. The idea behind the church was quite simple. The fire race are granted two lives. The first one, mediocre, with only five hearts. The second one, much stronger, with 10 hearts, permanent fire resistance, and a bonus of resistance won during the day. The goal of the church was to unite the entire fire race under one religion and make sure that they are all on their second lives before the borders drop, by baptizing the entire nation in fire. As the start of the event approached, we were gifted with a trailer which gave somewhat of an idea in terms of how the islands of each element would look like. As soon as we all saw the massive volcano, the first thing that we all thought was that it had to be the Fire Island, surely. The Enlightened Church of Fire, which already gathered quite the following from the Fire Race since it was the first quote-unquote fire-only faction, got very excited at the thought of all the possibilities in terms of roleplay and builds that could be done with the volcano. 
only to be utterly led down by the discovery that the volcano was actually covering the majority of the ice island. And so, the church laid down a mission of pilgrimage. The enlightened journey, which those who follow the faith will have to take on, traveling to their promised land as a crusade to liberate the volcano from heathens, labeling it as the sacred grounds of their faith, their long-lost holy sanctuary, where the spirit of the fire god lives. The enlightened Church of Fire made this information about their intentions quite public for all the other races to see. Immediately labeled as an aggressor, probably because of the whole crusade thing and the forceful baptisms, many factions tried to establish alliances with the Church in order to avoid possible conflicts. However, only one was accepted. The Frostburn Treaty, proposed by Floof, the leader of the Ice Empire. From what seemed to me like an all-gain, no-loss kind of offer, I saw it as a deal I could not refuse. And so, the alliance was made official. What followed suit was a plethora of political offers and negotiations that members from different factions sent my way, since I was the High Priest of the Fire Church. And while politics were never in the church's picture, I had to redirect these offers to someone else, since I wasn't responsible for the entire fire race, but I was still viewed as such for being the only public quote-unquote leader of a fire-only faction. Therefore, with the help of a few trusted friends, we assembled the majority of the fire race into one group, the Fire Kingdom and ran an election which was won by procrastination, the new leader of the fire race. With the entire Fire Island already mapped out from the test day a week prior to day one, the church already had a clear-cut plan. We would settle in a valley between two lakes in the corner of the Fire Island, which would be the furthest point away from any other islands for defensive purposes. We would build our temporary church, which we would use for storage up until borders drop and turn one of the smaller lakes into a lava pond where the baptisms would be held. Members of the church were each given one of the three roles. Resource gatherers, those who would take care of obtaining the required resources for building up the church lands. Missionaries, those who would spread the word of the holy fire by traveling to other settlements and factions in the later days, but would dedicate the first day to mining and collecting enough resources to get everyone geared up in iron and preferably diamonds. And lastly, builders, who would, as the name suggests it, build up the church lands and get the area ready. Everything was set for day one. But as always, things rarely go according to plan. You see, this is where I spent the majority of day one, alongside probably two-thirds of the entire server due to some severe technical difficulties which were caused by something I should probably not mention. While the appeal of joining the Void Cult was quite justified, granted I spent about two hours there, I saw it as a test of faith from the Fire God, a test which did not break me. Fortunately for the Church, Amidst the one-third of players that weren't trapped in the void and were actually able to play, were two fire priests, Siddlesticks, and Exmorph, 
who somehow managed to mine an insane amount of diamonds. And once I was finally free from the void, not only was I able to make my way to the church lands before the end of day one, but I was also gifted a fully enchanted diamond set of tools and armor by my fellow priests. And after chasing off people that settled in the church lands, the Fireball's Valley was ours. Due to the technical difficulties of the previous day, Day 2 was the official first day of the season, with Day 1 labeled as Day 0. Thus, all of the church's plans from Day 1 kind of carried themselves over to Day 2. Our goal was to complete the lava pond by the end of Day 2, made entirely out of lava source blocks, so that on Day 3 we can focus solely on decor. This would have been a pretty difficult task, if not for the tremendous efforts of our fellow church members, Thermo and Legacy, who made probably the biggest lava farm on the server at the time. This obviously did come with its own complications. You see, throughout the day, we had multiple people come over to our lava pond and steal our lava, both from the pond and the lava farm. And since PvP was still off, the only thing that we could really do about it is cover up the lava pond as soon as we fill it up, which slowed down our progress quite a bit. What we didn't know, however, was that the people who were stealing lava from us were from the Fire Kingdom, who settled right next to the Fire Church, and were using that lava for their own builds. And due to the fact that proxy voice chat wasn't working, there was a lot of confusion and miscommunication which quickly turned to hostilities, as we saw them as just a bunch of thieves and placed them on a hit list. Fortunately, this all got resolved, as those same quote-unquote thieves came back with gifts at the end of the day, asking to be forgiven for taking our lava and explaining why they did it. Apparently, the Fire Kingdom leader, Procrastination, endorsed the Enlightened Church of Fire heavily, and the Fire Kingdom considered it best to settle somewhere near us, in case they ever needed refuge or help. And thanks to the tremendous building efforts of one of our main priests, the aesthetics of the area attracted more and more members to the church. In the meantime, one of our other priests, Ultimate Demon, was taking care of the food situation and getting prepared for the time when peaceful mode will be turned off gathering hundreds of cows and farming them for steak and leather on the opposite side of the island. With the looming threat of COK pillagers roaming around him, Ultimate Demon thought it would be best to transport a couple of cows all the way to the church lands so that he can farm them there instead. And while he remained and farmed more cows at his side of the island, Kamari and Dio volunteered to transport a couple of cows to the church lands which they did successfully. With the lava pond being completed by the end of day two, we were one step closer to the fire baptisms. Originally, day three was the day when we planned to have the baptism ceremony. For context, members of the church were asked to not give up their first lives yet, and wait to do it all together at the main baptism ritual. They were also prohibited from giving forceful baptisms, allowing the fire race to come voluntarily to the lava pond at the scheduled date and time, making us feel more approachable and less aggressive. Unfortunately, there were two very important things missing that prevented us from holding the ceremony on day three. Number one, we still had no strings to make a loom, and no way to make our banners, no way to show our colors. This was because the server was still on peaceful mode, even on day three, and we had no way of obtaining strings due to the severe lack of mineshafts on our island and no spiders spawning at all. Number two, proxy voice chat was still malfunctioning, and therefore, 
disabled entirely, which prevented us from holding a proper sermon. Going into day three, however, we were certain that peaceful mode would be finally turned off and that mobs would start spawning, which means we would be able to get our hands on some strings. Unfortunately, upon joining the server, we were greeted by a very disappointing message that while PvP is now on, mobs will still be turned off. With steak being arguably the best food behind golden carrots and golden apples for PvP purposes, I headed towards the other side of the island where Ultimate Demon was holed up, still farming cows, as he needed to be escorted safely back to the church lands. And going alone, especially in iron armor, paints an easy target on your back, especially since PvP is now on. And after farming a whole stack of steak each and hiding the remainder of the cows deep underground, we safely returned to the church lands. With the pagoda now finished, we came across our church members who were lunged in deep prayer beside it, praying to the fire god to bless them with some strings so that they can make banners to represent their faith and our church. And once we joined them in prayer, our prayers were answered. Not only were we blessed with two looms, but the fire god even duplicated our banners, making our job much, much easier. Preparations continued for the baptisms of day four, as Siddlestix took it upon himself to entirely overhaul the lava pond and turn it into a proper ritual place. In the meantime, I thought it would be a good time to make friends with our neighbors, the Fire Kingdom, and gift them an item they were also looking for for a very long time. The church has a gift for our fellow neighbors. Oh, good. What is the, uh, what is what the is gift? Right here. Oh, hey, hey, hey. There you go. There's your gift. Hey, nice. we did it! What's the gift? Thank, what thank you get? so much, church. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Greetings, my priest. <laughs> As our alliances strengthened, the Fire Kingdom were very happy to cooperate and work together with the Fire Church towards a full-on unity of the Fire Race, looking forward to the baptisms on the following day. And as the Lava Pond was complete, we all lined up for a group photo to show for our efforts. The stage was set for day four, as this would be the day when the ceremonial baptisms in fire would take place. Thanks to Procrass and his devotion to the church, it was now mandatory for the entire fire race to attend the baptisms, as a way to show loyalty to the fire kingdom and Procrass himself as their leader. Anyone who dared to miss it would be exiled from the kingdom once and for all. This was Procrass's attempt at uniting the entire fire race under one faith, under one church, the enlightened Church of Fire. And with the majority of the fire race gathering around the lava pond, the sermon began. The enlightened Church of Fire welcomes you all on this very special and monumental occasion. Today, we are all here to unite the entire fire race and turn you all into the superior enlightened beings you were all meant to be. We were placed here by our mighty fire god, who bestowed great gifts upon those who seek to worship his element. Let us make you all unstoppable, get rid of the first life and become enlightened via the second life, be reborn by the phoenix. As per Procress's request, the first baptism was reserved for him, leading the entire fire race by example. And with chants of baptized in fire, reborn by the phoenix, echoing throughout the area as Procress plunged into the lava, the heavens opened. Thunder roared from the sky and Procress emerged from the lava, reborn and unharmed by the fire. 
And thus, the baptism of the entire fire race followed suit, as everyone jumped into the holy fire, chanting baptized in fire, reborn by the phoenix. Now on their second life, Procras and the Fire Kingdom militia were now ready to take the COK threat head on and make them pay for their crimes of harassing and pillaging the rest of the Fire Island during the previous day. While the military was occupied, the Fire Church had their own manhunt pending. Right before the fire race baptisms, when the masses were gathering around the lava pond, somebody by the name of the King of Games 12 decided it would be funny to pour water all over our lava pond, turning it into obsidian. Thankfully, due to the fact that there were a lot of people there at the time, the lava pond was quickly repaired and the heathen was chased off. However, after the baptisms, while we were repairing the pagoda from a fire that started on the previous day, the King of Games 12 decided to pour water all over our lava pond for the second time and run past us, setting fire to the pagoda again. This time, however, we did not hold back, chasing him all the way and blessing the world by giving it one less heathen. In the meantime, the Fire Kingdom militia was unsuccessful in their hunt for COK, getting themselves temporarily out of the picture, leaving the Fire Kingdom base entirely unprotected. This opened a window for COK to come and attack them defenseless. Wait, guys, I think COK's here, COK's here, COK's here, COK's here. COK's here, COK's here, COK's here. But they made their way to the church lands right on time, along with other refugees. The church agreed to take them all in and protect them from the looming threat of COK, which seemed to have worked, as COK continuously avoided stepping onto church lands, monitoring us from a safe distance. Day 5 was the day when all borders dropped, and people would no longer be dying in the origin storm. Hopefully. The church's plan for Day 5 was to split into two groups. The pilgrims, who would embark on the enlightened journey to the volcano at the ice island, and the monks, who would remain at the church lands on the fire island and maintain the place. Both Siddlesticks and myself did not participate in the baptisms of day four because we wanted to keep our first life and bring it with us all the way to the volcano to have the honor and privilege of being baptized in the Holy of Holies, the long lost fire sanctuary. Unfortunately for us, the volcano was severely desecrated thanks to the events of the previous day which saw the ice race civil war, with multiple internal factions revolting against the ice empire and its leaders. And while there was a lot of cleanup for us to do at the volcano, this was the most opportune moment to come to the ice island, as the majority of the ice race will be preoccupied with rebuilding and restoring their homeland. Or at least, that's what we thought. Instead, the Ice Island was missing the majority of its fighters and militia, because as soon as borders dropped, they made their way to the Air Island to assist in the chaos that ensued. The thing is, the entire air race, while powerful and prosperous, was also very fragile and heavily dependent on a magical crystal that could be found in the middle of their floating islands. The same magical crystal that granted them the power of flight and would bring the entire air race to their knees upon its destruction. This painted a massive target on the crystal and the entire air race as a whole, since the notorious factions of pillagers from all the elemental islands were now totally free to go wherever they pleased 
bringing death and destruction wherever they'd go. And upon their arrival to the Air Islands, all hell broke loose. An all-out war broke out at the Air Islands, with many different races joining the fight on both sides. And with the Air Race's best attempts at covering and defending the crystal, their defenses were breached, their fighters slaughtered, and their crystal destroyed. While the air race mourned the loss of their crystal, on the opposite side of the world, things were looking much more giddy at the ice island. The enlightened Church of Fire were finally reunited with their friends from different races upon reaching the volcano. And with everyone's help, they prepared the area for the long-awaited baptisms of the high priests, who managed to preserve their first lives all the way up until day five and with the chants of baptized in fire, reborn by the phoenix echoing throughout the volcanic crater, they both plunged into the sacred fires of the volcano, and were born anew, unlocking the full potential of their powers. With word of the church's arrival at the volcano spreading fast throughout the landscape, a vast majority of the ice race came down to the volcano to greet the Holy Order. As not only did they bring the message of enlightenment to the ice lands, they also brought something that only the fire race had access to up until now. The enchantment table. And so, day five saw both opposing sides of the elemental world. Death, destruction, and chaos at the air islands, peace, strength, and unity at the ice islands. Amongst all the chaos and destruction at the air islands on the previous day, there was one massive positive that was salvaged from all the negatives. We now had valuable information, names in particular, of all the individuals from all different races that were responsible for the destruction of the magical crystal and the downfall of the air race. As it turns out, that group of people consisted of C.O.K. and the Fire Kingdom Militia, better known as the Watchers, who put aside their differences and united their efforts in destroying the air crystal and wiping out the air race. Not only that, members of another underground faction from the Ice Island, who were partially responsible for the revolution of Day 4, simply known as DDR, were also spotted at the fight, aiding the perpetrators. And with the air race decimated, the Ice Island suddenly saw an influx of immigrants from all corners of the world. Thus, the Chroma Coalition, a secret organization of the most powerful leaders of factions currently situated on the Ice Island, was formed to defend and manage the island from the looming threat of the Watchers, COK, and DDR. A union of sorts that would maintain peace and order amongst all factions. After the events of the previous day, Day 6 was a grace period, where players got the chance to build and explore the world without having to constantly wash their backs. After all, even the conquerors of the air crystal needed some time to lick their wounds and gather themselves, preparing for whatever may come next. This was the perfect time for the enlightened Church of Fire to begin the cleansing of their sanctuary restoring the volcano to its former glory before it got desecrated by ice heathens. 
Unfortunately, members of the church found out soon enough that it was far too great of a task for mere mortals to complete. Thus, as always, turning to prayer. The high priests of the church constructed an altar in the very middle of the volcano and prayed to the fire god, offering a diamond pickaxe in exchange for help in restoring at least some of the volcano. And their prayers were answered, as a massive chunk of ice quickly melted around the altar, and the holy fire of the volcano engulfed the layer of obsidian sitting atop of it. This great miracle was visible from all around the volcanic crater, as all members of the church jumped into the lava to reach the altar in the middle and rejoiced. What followed next was a celebration of faith, as the entire enlightened church of fire gathered at the altar to commemorate the successful completion of the enlightened journey. The great feats of faith that the church was able to accomplish brought even more people towards them, as more and more players began settling at the volcano, feeling safe and protected by being around those who they saw as sheer miracle workers, whose faith was arguably the strongest in the entire elemental world, always having the fire god by their side. As great as the grace period was, everyone knew that it wasn't gonna last forever. I personally knew it firsthand, as I was invited to attend a council meeting on the following day with all the other faction leaders under the Chroma Coalition to discuss a few matters at hand. You see, ever since the Fire Kingdom attack on the Air Crystal, the Fire Race became the most feared race out of all the elemental races. My goal was to alleviate tensions and clear up assumptions amongst the Council of the Chroma Coalition and, if need be, make my way back to the Fire Island and meet up with the Fire Lord himself. Procrastination. The Chroma Coalition Council meeting was set to happen shortly after the beginning of Day 7, and thus, without wasting much time, I notified the church members that I will be going away for a while and judging by how most council meetings end up in civilization events, I mentioned to them that there is a slight chance that I may not return. And to make sure that the enlightened church of fire does not remain leaderless in my absence, I appointed Siddlesticks, the only other high priest besides myself, to take charge of the church while I'm gone. And so, with my earthling friend N.C. Archie by my side, we headed straight to the Greenwich Temple at the Meridian Base, just east of the volcano. Upon arriving at the temple, the Meridian members had already appointed people to act as guards and refrain outsiders from approaching the temple in order to preserve peace and safety of those who are taking part in the Chroma Coalition Council. The council consisted of the following factions and their respectful leaders. Meridian, headed by Abraxan and co-leaders. The Soaring Angels Collective, led by Tilly. Skyhaven, by K4 Lit, Valhalla by Rezo, The Ocean Alliance by Exchance, The Ice Empire by Mindless, who replaced Floof in his absence, The Peacekeepers by Joshimant, and The Enlightened Church of Fire by yours truly. There were many things discussed at this meeting, but to summarize it, there were three major topics of conversation. The first one was establishing a proper defense plan and what each faction would do in case there was ever an attack on the Ice Island. Second, we discussed the kill on sight list, made by Meridian, which consisted of members belonging to factions that launched the attack on the Air Crystal, as the list needed updating, 
adding new names who became enemies of the public more recently and removing those who have already died. And finally, the most important matter at hand, procrastination. You see, most of the Chroma Coalition Council had a personal vendetta against Procrast, believing him to be the one calling the shots behind all the bloodthirsty members of the Fire Kingdom militia. My sole purpose there was to play devil's advocate, and make people think twice before going into an all-out war with the Fire Kingdom. I brought up a few key points in his defense, as Procras was the very first member of the Fire Kingdom to be baptized in fire, and he always publicly endorsed the enlightened Church of Fire, being a follower of the religion. And on the previous day, he established a non-aggression pact between the Dwarven Pillarmen Republic and the Fire Kingdom, demonstrating his desire for diplomacy and peace, as opposed to war and chaos. I also had mentioned that I refused to believe that Procrast would ever do anything to harm the Church and its members, as that would be considered sacrilege, and he would be seen as a heathen in the eyes of the entire world, bringing down the wrath of the Fire God upon him. Therefore, I proposed the following. Anyone who wishes to avoid war entirely and live in peace and harmony should make their way to the volcano and settle at the fire sanctuary. Likewise, if a war ever breaks out and the ice factions find themselves at a disadvantage, they should immediately retreat to the volcano as that's the only place where Procrast won't kill anyone. Because if the blood of the innocents is spilled at the sanctuary, it would be considered sacrilege. The Council were still highly skeptical of Procrast's integrity and questioned his trust. And in order to alleviate tensions, I promised them to meet with Procrast, alone, and have a one-on-one -on -one discussion with him to resolve and cover absolutely everything. Without wasting any more time, I requested to meet with Procrast immediately, in order to discuss some important political matters that were brought up at the Chroma Coalition Council meeting. We both agreed to meet each other alone, one-on-one, -on -one, to make sure that this meeting stays private. The main thing that I brought up with Procrast was the no PvP rule at the volcano, and asked him to give me his word that he would honor that rule and our religion, which he did. I also advised him that if he ever decides to go after any of the ice factions, that it would be a very steep uphill battle, as the ice empire and Meridian largely outnumber the Fire Kingdom militia. Procrast agreed to that point and claimed that he has no reason to fight against them. However, we both knew that this season of the event shall not end without one final battle. Therefore, both Procrass and I laid out the following plan. Ice Empire and Meridian, together with the Air Faction's Skyhaven and the Soaring Angels Collective, are allied together with the Enlightened Church of Fire. The Church, in turn, is also allied with the Fire Kingdom, who are allied with the Pillarmen thus creating a multi-race alliance across the entire elemental world. In order for Procrast to prove his trust and show his integrity to the Ice Factions, he agreed to challenge whatever other groups exist in the world that are not part of this multi-race alliance, where all of these small factions would all unite together into one big army and take on the Fire Kingdom and their allies in one final battle. What I didn't expect, however, is for Procrast to go back on his word and unite all those other smaller factions together in a military alliance with the Fire Kingdom and prepare for a complete takeover of the Ice Island. Upon my return back to the volcano, 
we began preparations for what we anticipated to be a massive exodus of people from all different islands, who wanted to remain neutral and have their safe haven at the sanctuary. And while the other political groups discussed their war plans, the enlightened Church of Fire spent the remainder of Day 8 building up infrastructure, laying out the foundations of what will once be a thriving civilization. With the Holy Fire enclosed and protected by walls, and the construction of Mount Elmore, representing the leaders of the largest factions on the Ice Island now completed, Sanctuary's development progressed exponentially. But not for long. You see, as was previously mentioned, we expected a mass exodus of people that would come to Sanctuary to seek refuge from the onslaught that everyone anticipated would come at some point. However, we also knew that there would be those who would want to use us for our generosity, which is exactly what happened on Day 9. The Forgotten Neverlands, a faction that we grew to be quite familiar with at the Fire Island from their numerous attempts at trying to steal our resources, have followed us all the way to the volcano, and have been continuously using up our resources as if they were their own. I took it upon myself to warn them multiple times and ask them persistently to leave us alone and stop using our resources, or there would be consequences. With my requests falling on deaf ears, I decided that enough was enough, rallied all of the members of the church, and confronted the entirety of the Forgotten Neverlands faction. This time, as a collective, we demanded that the Forgotten Neverlands leave the volcano and never return, or we will treat them as common heathens and show them no mercy. Tensions were high, as both factions awaited for the other to strike first. The enlightened Church of Fire stood its ground, united and unbothered by the Forgotten Neverlands' provocative antics. And upon acknowledging our strength in unity, the Forgotten Neverlands retreated, as the enlightened Church of Fire stood tall to end Day 9. The animosity, however, continued beyond the game, as the Church received many mixed signals from the different members of the Forgotten Neverlands. Some said they wanted peace and a place to stay, while others claimed that it's all a front and that they wish to destroy the Church of Fire. Day 10 was anticipated to be the final day of the event, as most factions decided that they've had enough just sitting there waiting to be attacked, and everyone had plans to go into an all-out war. With rumors of the Fire Kingdom coming to the Ice Island to attack Meridian, and the Ice Empire going after the Ice Legion, we knew we would be caught right in the middle of it all. Therefore, our main goal for Day 10 was to preserve Sanctuary, preserve the peace at the volcano, and preserve our holy fire by any means necessary. The Soaring Angels Collective, having their relationship fall apart with the other ice factions, offered themselves for the Fire Church to serve and protect. And in order to make sure that the Forgotten Neverlands don't go back on their word, the Soaring Angels Collective were tasked in keeping a close eye on the Forgotten Neverlands and prevent them from causing too much damage. Tensions were at an all-time high. Thus began Day 10. The Fire Kingdom did not wait a second, as they marched towards Meridian to answer their war declaration. Meridian met the Fire Kingdom midway, and with the help of some recruited mercenaries from the Earth Island, attempted to fight back the threat. And while Meridian suffered numerous casualties, they were able to force the Fire Kingdom into retreat, back 
to the Fire Island. You see, the Fire Kingdom had a non-aggression pact with the Earth race. And upon seeing the Earthlings helping Meridian, that pact was broken. They gathered their resources, rallied all their members, and headed straight towards the Earth Island, where they decimated most of the Earth factions, leaving their government structure in complete shambles. While the world was stained in blood for the majority of Day 10, Sanctuary was the only place that was able to preserve its peace. After the Forgotten Neverlands left to help in the war, something life-changing has happened at the volcano. As members of different factions and different races made their way down to Sanctuary to be baptized in fire, despite the fact that they weren't of the fire race and did not have the blessing of the phoenix. This is just how strong our message of enlightenment was proven to be. The tenth day of the event not only marked the baptism of all races, but even of Iha's name himself, and Sanctuary became the core of the elemental world, standing together in the midst of war, united and enlightened. The Enlightened Church of Fire knew that if there were no attempts made in order to either defuse or conclude this war between the Fire Kingdom and Meridian, that they would eventually get caught in the crossfire, no matter how neutral they are. Therefore, I decided to conduct a World Summit, where the leader of each of the main elemental factions would come to represent the entire race and voice out their concerns with each other in a respectful and peaceful manner. It was agreed that in order to keep things civil, each leader will have to come alone, with the Fire Church as the overseers of this meeting, being the only ultimate neutral faction. The meeting was set to take place at the same field, in the same house, on the Fire Island, where I met with Procrast a few days prior, as soon as Day 11 began. And as all the leaders made their way to the meeting place, I recruited some friends who you might remember from another time to come with me, as those were the people I trusted the most, leaving sanctuary in the hands of Solus, our sage, to take care of our followers and to prepare for the inevitable onslaught that might occur if things go south at the World Summit. progressed for quite a while, with the leaders going as far back as Day 5, discussing the attack on the Air Crystal. And since we were in a public space for such a long time, other players who were passing by began gathering around the meeting house, trying to not only find out what's going on, but also sabotage the World Summit, as one would in pretty much every civilization event. Luckily, the Enlightened Church of Fire was able to maintain order and prevent anyone from either entering the meeting house or blowing all of us up. Oh, they know. Do you right. really expect that from like a bunch of Civ event players? <laughs> Honestly, I no. That we're, doing but we're talking in a we're talking in the lore standpoint. You know? <laughs> Damn it! Oh, well, for that real. Point to get stuff killed, bro. Despite our best efforts of advocating for peace. The Fire Kingdom simply could not forgive Meridian for putting them on a kill on sight list after the events of Day 5. And so, Abraxan and Procrast shook on it, and wished each other good luck in the now inevitable war that was about to happen. With the meeting concluded, everyone dispersed and went to prepare for the final battle, while the three of us decided to head back to Sanctuary and alert everyone in terms of what's about to happen. Things were peaceful as usual in Sanctuary, with everyone following Solus's command and building bunkers with traps 
in case we were to get attacked. Giving Procras the benefit of the doubt, and hoping that he won't go back on his promise of not engaging in any fights at the volcano, we left Sanctuary and headed towards Meridian, where everyone was gathering and preparing for the Fire Kingdom attack. Little did we know that the Fire Kingdom's first course of action was to attack the builders of the Ice Empire, who were peacefully managing their town right on top of Sanctuary. Naturally, the Ice Empire descended down to Sanctuary looking for help with the Fire Kingdom on their backs, while the Church's main fighters were anticipating the attack at the Meridian base. Sanctuary became the center of mass confusion as members of the Fire Kingdom began attacking members of the Church thinking they were with the Ice Empire for not bearing the same American shields as them. The cries of battle soared through the Ice Island as all three of us immediately turned back to save our people. And as we arrived at Sanctuary, we were able to divert the confusion of war away from the Fire Church, fighting off whoever was there and whatever else they brought with them. Thanks to the tremendous leadership of Solus in my absence, the enlightened Church of Fire suffered minimal casualties, as most of them were able to make it into their bunkers in time. And for the remainder of Day 11, Ultimate Demon, N.C. Archie, and myself stood guard on the streets of Sanctuary, protecting our faith and our people with our lives. With the cries of war subsiding, as Meridian and the Fire Kingdom reached a stalemate in their battle. Members of the enlightened Church of Fire came out of their bunkers and joined us on the streets of Sanctuary. And as we stood there, together, united and whole once more, the Fire Church rejoiced and celebrated our achievements. Baptized in fire, reborn by the Phoenix, joined by faith, United in peace. Once again, a massive thanks to I Has Name for hosting this event and allowing us all to participate in it. Make sure to check out his channel and join the Races Discord server if you wish to participate in Season 4 of the event. However, if you'd like to know more about the place which the Enlightened Church of Fire originated from and follow the journey of its members, Join our world building server. Join Loreworks.